discharge. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, the request was uh, for this talk to be again about kind of a, an approach to a patient in, a, in the ER and I didn't want to uh, repeat some of the things that I had spoken about earlier. So uh, I'm going to talk more specifically about how to approach uh, a confused patient in the emergency department. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that's the point of the talk. So uh, the goals uh, that we want to try to uh, review today. So uh, really uh, in terms of uh, talking about uh, confused patients in the ER, uh, it's going to be focusing a lot on delirium. So uh, after this talk, you should uh, know more about the definition, pathophysiology and criteria for delirium, uh, the consequences, how to detect it, how to prevent it, and uh, how to manage it. So I think one of the first things I want to ask you is, uh, you know, say you have a, a, an older individual, say a 75-year-old man presents to the emergency department uh, with confusion, comes in, say brought in by his wife with confusion. Um, what would be your initial approach? Anyone want to try a, a stab at that? Or can I, or does this not work uh, to hear from everybody? Um, it should work. Uh, anyone can uh, unmute and, uh, and join. I mean, uh, I think my approach is going to be, uh, what do you mean by confusion? Uh, uh, is it that uh, he doesn't make sense, for example, anymore? Or uh, is, does he have any difficulty with talking, kind of this unfair presentation? Uh, is this is new or old? Uh, and uh, if this is new, I will think more of delirium. Then I'll try to see if there is any uh, metabolic or trauma or pain or infectious uh, cause that would uh, make me uh, think about uh, a precipitating cause for the presentation. Okay, thank you for that answer. I think it's a good answer. Uh, I'll kind of uh, talk about what I think are some of the main points about that. The first is really recognizing the importance of having a good history and especially central to that history is figuring out is this a new problem or has it been going on for a while because it's really going to lead you down uh, two different pathways. Uh, so we'll talk about that, you know, so, you know, the question is, um, is this uh, a chronic problem like dementia? Is it an acute problem like delirium or something else like a, uh, a stroke or a cerebrovascular accident? And obviously your management to those things is going to be very different. But I think that the one thing I want to impress uh, and, and part of the reason I asked the question is uh, it's, it's always important to remember ABCs. Uh, you want to make sure that your patient is stable. Uh, and the confused patient in the ER is already a, a sign of potential poor outcomes, uh, someone who could be potentially unstable and could get worse very quickly. Um, we know very well that uh, the brain is and the confusion that someone can have is almost like a, another important vital sign in terms of uh, being an important barometer of poor outcomes. People are more likely to die. People are more likely to need to be admitted. People are more likely to not uh, return home uh, if, they, if they have delirium. And it can be really a, a sign of uh, important destabilization in a, in a medical issue. So you want to uh, you don't want to put that patient on the back burner to be seen later. You want to try to focus on them sooner rather than later and make sure that you're not missing something uh, acute uh, and that they could become uh, unstable. It's always important to recognize, and especially in an exam uh, setting, as well as in real life, uh, you know, that's, that's where uh, mistakes can be made. So uh, remember the ABCs, we're not really gonna talk about that because this is not, uh, you know, uh, I'm not an intensivist giving you a talk, but I think it's important to re recognize it as a potential sign of acuity. 
So um, that's our outline. So the, the first thing, and I think uh, really important is starting with that history and knowing exactly what you're dealing with uh, in terms of, is this looking more like we're going down the path of uh, someone with delirium or is this somebody uh, coming in with uh, uh, more related to a chronic issue like a dementia? You know, emergency departments are not really meant to be the place to deal with chronic issues like dementia, but people can uh, have uh, uh, acute worsenings in it, uh, uh, development of more uh, behavioral problems or trouble coping, and that can precipitate a, a visit to the emergency room. Uh, and so you might see someone come in uh, with, uh, with dementia, uh, but uh, what you're often likely to see uh, and uh, what we're going to focus on in this talk is, is delirium. So how do you tell them apart? Well, they're both changes in cognition. Uh, what is cognition? Cognition uh, is a broad term for anything that has to deal with how the brain thinks. So in dementia, we think uh, a lot uh, of it having to do with uh, memory. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, as because the most common cause of dementia is Alzheimer's disease, which involves memory. Uh, in delirium, it uh, tends to involve attention and concentration more. That's the central uh, cognitive issue uh, that we deal with in delirium. Uh, but cognition can also be visual spatial function, organizing things uh, in uh, in space, getting lost easy. It can be executive function, uh, planning, organizing, and decision making. It could be language as well. Um, and uh, uh, you'll notice that somebody who has attention difficulties will have difficulties in all of those different cognitive domains, whereas somebody well, more with dementia who maybe has a memory issue, uh, their attention and concentration might be relatively well preserved. So that's one of the distinguishing features uh, that we use. And you can see it down on the bottom of the list in terms of uh, criteria. A deserved level of con uh, disturbed level of consciousness and inattention is, is somewhat rare in dementia, uh, except perhaps in the most severe stages, uh, which you'd be able to pick out in history and that had been present for a long time. So again, that's the other important thing that you touched on uh, in terms of uh, talking about getting the history. Is this acute onset over the hour of uh, over the last few hours or days, or has this been going on over years? Uh, the other thing is fluctuation. Uh, so. Uh, Dementia very rarely fluctuates. People can have slightly good days and slightly worse days, depending on certain things, but they don't go from being, you know, almost completely normal to being very confused. And then the other thing uh, with delirium is that uh, often people will present with uh, hallucinations or delusions, whereas in dementia, that's rather rare. So these are our key main distinguishing features so that you know which pathway you're going down in terms of uh, working up the patient. So things can be a little bit complicated in terms of that distinction. And I'll mention some of the things where, you know, that can throw you off and make you think somebody with dementia might have delirium or delirium might have dementia. And the first thing that will throw you off is that you can actually have both at the same time, and it's very common to have both at the same time. So someone with dementia doesn't exclude the fact that they might get delirious. And in fact, they're more likely to get delirious and they're more likely to get delirious with um, um, more minor things. You have somebody come in with just constipation and become delirious if they have dementia, uh, whereas it'd be very unusual for someone with normal cognition to uh, become uh, delirious from constipation unless they had like hepatic encephalopathy. Uh, so, uh, so you can have both going on. And again, that's the importance of the nuances in the history. You know, if they say, well, you know, they have mild stage dementia, but now, uh, uh, you know, they're significantly more confused uh, and fluctuating and having hallucinations and they never had that before. That's probably a sign that both are going on at the same time. The other thing that can happen is uh, you, you, we occasionally, and this is not very common, but occasionally get something like a subacute delirium due to uh, underlying medical problem that hasn't been yet diagnosed, but it's been going on for a long time. So uh, 
we commonly see this of people who might have endocarditis or osteomyelitis, uh, or sometimes like a chronic uh, PE, uh, and uh, you know, very rarely, but it can happen. You might see somebody who's been delirious for a month or two until you diagnose that kind of chronic acute medical problem. And then uh, once you address it, they, they slowly get better. So, you know, the hours to days thing doesn't always apply 100%. Uh, you can also have rapidly progressive dementia, uh, which is also very rare. Uh, and uh, uh, things like uh, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease or um, uh, uh, like lupus cerebritis uh, or CNS vasculitis uh, or paraneoplastic syndromes can cause these rapidly progressive dementias. Again, they're different from delirium. They don't tend to fluctuate. Uh, they tend to be uh, uh, more happening over the course of more than just a few days. The other thing is lack of good history. How do you know if somebody has an acute or chronic onset of cognitive problems and is fluctuating, unless there's someone to, who's been observing them well to tell you, because often the patient's confused, they have memory problems, they can't tell you themselves. So you really need to seek out that collateral. You need to call a family member, you need to speak with uh, maybe uh, someone at the residence uh, or the nursing home where they might be living um, uh, to know. Or sometimes it's just having them in the emergency department for long enough that you start to notice that there's that fluctuation happening. Uh, so talking to the nurse who's looking after them uh, can often uh, provide great insight in terms of uh, what's this patient's trajectory looking like. And then the other thing is uh, Lewy body dementia. There's a certain kind of dementia, the second most common cause of dementia after Alzheimer's disease, where people can have earlier presentation with hallucinations, and they also tend to fluctuate. So we can struggle sometimes in understanding if somebody has Lewy body dementia versus delirium. And the key distinguishing feature there, again, is the time course. Is it new or has this been going on for a while? Okay. So these are the things that can throw you off, but generally as a rule of thumb, uh, this is what we use to distinguish is your confused patient delirious or is your confused patient having um, dementia? And obviously the management is very different. So one of the first things you want to be sure uh, with delirium is that you know how to spell it properly. And uh, delirium is not spelled D-E-L-E-R-I-U-M. It's spelled uh, with an I instead of an E. Uh, as you can see here, D-E-L-I-R-I-U-M. Delirium is actually the name of a, a music uh, band. Uh, I haven't really listened to their music, but uh, um, apparently some people like it. Uh, so if you say someone has delirium, then uh, it's, a, it's a little bit different uh, than delirium with an I. Um, anyways, uh, more seriously, uh, delirium uh, has been recognized for quite a long time. Uh, as long as there's been people, they've been getting delirious. Uh, uh, Hippocrates described it. Um, it has many different names, uh, crazy or to rave. Uh, it, uh, um, it was early recognized that it was asso associated with underlying medical issues like fever or head trauma. Uh, and uh, what is, uh, what, what is uh, delirium exactly, what causes it, is actually rather poorly understood uh, and uh, something that's very hard to measure. It would be really nice if we had like a blood test, if we could measure somebody's uh, serum uh, cortisol or, or serotonin and uh, we're able to figure out, okay, well, you know, that's a, a sign of delirium. We know that these things are are related. We know that um, effects on cortisol, effects on serotonin, uh, reduced oxygen, uh, all can uh, uh, all seem to be associated with it somehow. Uh, we know that it's associated with some kind of underlying medical condition that causes this dysfunction in the brain. But uh, the exact mechanism of how that happens, uh, uh, what we can do to 
to try to treat it. Uh, you know, I get also uh, uh, there seems to be some implication of the uh, cholinergic system like we see in dementia, um, uh, cholinergic uh, deficits. Uh, but uh, you know, not no uh, biochemical way of treating uh, dopamine or uh, acetylcholine or cortisol or or just giving someone more oxygen uh, seems to uh, have an effect. So what does that mean? It means it's probably uh, due to a little bit of all those things and it's uh, multifactorial. Other names for delirium that you might encounter, uh, brain failure, acute confusional state, acute organic brain syndrome, uh, post-operative psychosis. So they're all uh, different terms, but uh, most widely it's understood as uh, uh, delirium and a uh, brain failure is also the name of a band. Uh, there you go. Uh, delirium. Uh, the best definition that we have is uh, from the DSM, and that's the one we uh, uh, consistently use. Uh, you know, it, they are always tweaking things a little bit in terms of the various versions of the DSM, uh, but there's not much change between five and four. Uh, so, what are the criteria for delirium? And again, you know, these are not the be all and end all, and, and no criteria in the DSM is perfect. They describe clinical things that we find, uh, but then again, you know, it's not something we have a, a definitive uh, blood test or scan or something that uh, says you have it or you don't. Uh, we know it exists as a phenomenon, but uh, and we try our best to define it, but uh, you know, this is what we have so far in terms of our gold standard as the DSM criteria. So a disturbance of consciousness with reduced attention, we already mentioned that. A change in cognition, um, not accounted for by dementia. Uh, it uh, develops over hours and days and fluctuates during the course of the day. Uh, so that fluctuation and again, cute onset. And then uh, the very important thing in the DSM criteria is they, uh, they Im imply that inherently there's some underlying medical issue um, that, that's causing it, some underlying medical condition. You know, the problem with that is that sometimes people come in, we know they have delirium and it's hard to figure out what exactly that underlying medical condition is. You know, so that's one potentially problematic issue with delirium. And you can see that, you know, you can't just take this criteria and easily apply it to whether or not someone has delirium or not until you've actually taken the time to assess them, take a history, do a physical exam uh, and do some tests and investigations. Uh, so in practice, the DSM criteria, although they're the gold standard, you know, it, it actually takes some work to figure out whether or not uh, somebody has it or not, uh, which we'll get into later, you know, the idea that we need a better way of being able to screen quickly for whether or not somebody might have a delirium. What are the consequences of it? So uh, we know that people with delirium have a very significant risk of not winding up going back home, uh, needing to go to a nursing home or a residence uh, when they leave the hospital. Uh, they tend to stay in the hospital much longer. They tend to have functional decline. They don't always recover their cognitive function. Uh, somewhere between 60 and 80% do, but it's not uh, anywhere near 100%. Uh, and then most importantly, uh, they have a much higher rate of mortality. Um, this has been studied uh, and uh, you can see uh, you know, a uh, very significant uh, risk of mortality uh, in the upper graph. I know it's small, but uh, you're all on your computers, so you can probably see uh, that uh, the hazard ratio for mortality is anywhere between uh, around uh, two up to up to four on average. So, you know, that's quite significant. Um, and uh, with uh, institutionalization, it's even more than that. Uh, and uh, again, also here at the bottom, you see that link between delirium and dementia. So 
Uh, some people get delirium, they're more likely to get dementia, but then they're also more likely to uh, have de, uh, delirium if they have dementia. Uh, so uh, it's a, a sign really with dementia that your brain is more fragile and you're more susceptible to it. I like to think of it as kind of a, um, a balance between, you know, are you going to get delirium with an with a underlying medical issue? Well, if the issue is severe enough, uh, so if you think about younger patients in the ICU, uh, if they're sick enough, they're, they're more likely to get delirium even though they might not have dementia. Uh, but if your dementia is significant enough, your brain is more fragile and, and even more minor things like uh, a constipation or a, a simple urinary tract infection uh, or um, the side effect of a medication uh, might be enough to precipitate uh, delirium. So the other issue that we have to contend with is that delirium is one of the most missed uh, medical diagnoses. It's not detected in 22 to 50% of cases. And it can all, it be often mistaken for other things. So you see you have a confused patient in the emergency room uh, without uh, history uh, or further exploration. You might just assume that they have dementia, uh, but uh, if, if you looked into it further, you might realize, no, they were completely uh, normal uh, before they uh, came in. Uh, it can look like depression. A lot of people say, well, you know, that person's just old, so they're confused. Um, hearing and vision impairment, uh, uh, you might uh, attribute it to that, uh, whereas uh, uh, it's actually a delirium, or again, both going on, uh, and, uh, and then uh, pain. Um, so again, what are the what are the key things that we're often missing information on is uh, how it has been fluctuating uh, and then uh, not getting that collateral history. Uh, if the patient's confused, they're not going to be able to tell you that or recognize that they're confused uh, or be able to uh, uh, preemptively go out and tell you that this is a change. Um, and uh, the other, probably the most a uh, missed case of delirium is what we call hypoactive delirium. So um, if you notice uh, in terms of our criteria, we talk about perceptual disturbances and agitation being common in delirium, but you actually have quite a few cases of delirium where you don't necessarily have to has, have that. And instead their fluctuating level of consciousness uh, is more consistently associated with just being uh, drowsy or hard to wake up or arouse, uh, and uh, we call that a hypoactive presentation of delirium. They still have acute onset, they still have fluctuation, they still have inattention, but uh, their disturbance and level of consciousness is, is suppressed rather, rather more than, than agitated, uh, and, uh, and that's very often missed without uh, uh, a good history and consideration. Uh, so how is it best to detect delirium when we can't necessarily uh, go ahead and do that whole uh, assessment that's required to fulfill all the DSM criteria? Well, a lot of different screening tools have, uh, have been uh, used and assessed, uh, but uh, uh, the one that's most, com uh, most uh, uh, what best validated and most commonly used and definitely something that you will encounter in your careers is something called the confusion assessment method. Uh, it's uh, quick to do. Uh, it's often part of protocols in the emergency department. Your nurses are often uh, doing it uh, and uh, it can be done quickly within five minutes. But then again, it still requires being able to get a history or being able to observe the patient enough to know that these problems are acute in terms of their onset and fluctuating. So we have either acute onset or fluctuating course. Acute onset, you have to get some history. Fluctuating course, you have to observe the patient uh, well enough or get that on history. Uh, the inattention, how do you assess inattention? It's not um, 
like we see people often doing going and asking the person oh do you know where you are uh oh uh, i'm in a hotel no actually you're in the emergency room at the hospital well uh that is wrong and it's a sign of a cognitive issue but it could very well just be that the person has alzheimer's disease and doesn't remember where they are but it could also be that they're inattentive and not recognizing where they are so that doesn't really help you uh, you have to notice the in inattention more subjectively in terms of your observation or objectively with certain tests how do we test inattention there's many different ways uh, classically on the for example the mmsc we use serial sevens we use spelling wor world backwards uh, those are tests of attention uh, you could also ask someone to do something like the days of the week or the months of the year backwards. Uh, you could uh, uh, have someone do a digit span. So, for example, uh, it's normal to remember uh, a um, seven digit telephone number. Okay, and most normal people would be able to do that. Somebody who has attention problems, they're going to have a hard time repeating back uh, seven digits to you. Uh, and so you could try that uh, and you might notice someone with delirium has much more difficulty repeating back numbers. They can only repeat, repeat back three digits or four digits in a row. That's really abnormal. That's a sign of inattention. Uh, and, you know, that inattention is, uh, is really the cognitive issue that we're worried about in delirium. And uh, if it's bad enough, like, you know, not being able to do days of the week backwards, months of the year backwards, um, or, uh, you know, a digit span less than, say, five, uh, you know, even somebody even somebody with moderate dementia should be able to, to do those types of things. So it's a pretty good sign in terms of inattention if you want something objective. Uh, disorganized uh, thinking. So there's your uh, a little bit more of a technical term for uh, confusion. And then uh, very importantly, uh, the altered level of consciousness. So, and that's the person who could be the hypoactive delirium, you know, who's stuporous or comatose or lethargic, but it can also go the other way in terms of being hypervigilant, alert, uh, hallucinating or agitated. So you can see if to have CAM positive delirium, you have to have A and B as well as either C or D. And you can, you notice this is very similar, but not exactly the same as the DSM criteria. Uh, but uh, it allows you a little bit of a more quick way of uh, doing that assessment. And it uh, excludes that issue of, okay, well, is there an underlying medical diagnosis, which would be your next step after you found somebody with who you think might have delirium based on the CAM, okay, and that's try to figure out what's causing it. So delirium is very common in the emergency room. Uh, all kinds of different studies uh, look at the, the prevalence. Uh, if 30 to 50 percent, you know, that's in uh, older patients and so not all patients in the emergency room. It's even more common uh, once people are admitted to, uh, to the hospital. Uh, and the important thing is that delirium can be prevented uh, in almost a third to a half of people who are at risk. So we, could, we can do really well in terms of preventing it and preventing all those adverse consequences of it. We can discharge people home faster. We can avoid admission. We can avoid people going to nursing homes. We can avoid cognitive decline uh, with uh, some thought on prevention. So what I'm saying in terms of this talk is, you know, it's an approach to a patient with confusion, but it's also an approach to preventing your patient who didn't come in with confusion from getting confusion. Um, so how do we prevent delirium? Uh, well, there's actually really good evidence for it. And it's like many things in geriatrics. It's not about just doing one thing. It's about uh, addressing all the potential causes for delirium. You know, it's not just about treating the UTI, but also uh, making sure that your patient isn't, uh, didn't get dehydrated while they were in the emergency room or didn't 
become hypoxic and need oxygen or wasn't tied down to the bed and became immobile uh, or didn't start getting medications that uh, are uh, a risk. So, you know, for example, antiemetics or sleeping pills, um, that their pain is well controlled, that they're eating well, and then also the sensory impairment. You know, uh, do they have their glasses? Do they have their hearing aids? Uh, and, uh, and sleep, sleep's very important too. If I uh, think of being in the emergency room for three days with all the noise and things going on and being sleep deprived, uh, it's, uh, it's really not good and uh, can uh, precipitate that. So, you know, part of the thing we really encourage for people is uh, uh, older people in the emergency room is uh, we need a disposition plan. We need to figure out whether we're sending them home or admitting them because being down in the emergency department uh, is going to lead to uh, all these things, less mobility. There's not really the space. Uh, to walk around uh, uh, the staffing uh, to make sure that people mobilize uh, and are drinking and eating properly. And, uh, and also it's not uh, an optimal place uh, to, to be sleeping. Uh, so uh, how can we accomplish all of those things? Well, uh, there's really good evidence uh, about uh, uh, hiring volunteers uh, to stay with patients, kind of almost like surrogate family members to make sure that they're walking, they're eating, they're drinking well. And uh, that program uh, with the volunteers uh, clearly shows a significant decrease in the amount of people uh, developing uh, delirium. So it's something to think about, uh, you know, when a family member is asking you, you know, can I come visit my patient and you're trying to make the decision, you know, they might actually be helpful to have uh, close by at the bedside to attend uh, to the person to make sure that uh, they don't uh, develop a delirium. Um, we don't have a, a, a volunteer hospital elder life program uh, here in uh, Quebec, uh, but uh, we are trying to encourage the staff that we have, nurses, uh, PABs, to try to make sure that all these things are looked after for patients to prevent delirium. Um, but uh, it's certainly uh, a work and, and uh, educational uh, uh, process and, and really difficult uh, with uh, challenges in terms of staffing. So uh, delirium is going to be with us uh, for, for a while. Uh, but um, uh, if we're attentive to these things and we all do our part, uh, even physicians, if you bring that patient uh, uh, a glass of water before you leave their bedside or uh, make sure that they've got their hearing aids or their glasses or um, try to um, go for a walk with them, every, every little thing uh, can make a difference. Um, so what if you already have delirium? Uh, how do you What's your approach to management and, and treatment? Uh, so uh, unfortunately, uh, the evidence about treating delirium, you know, for example, getting a geriatrics consult uh, is not as robust as the evidence for preventing it. Uh, we don't have the same evidence that um, treating it once it's already uh, set in uh, will, uh, with a geriatric consult or treating uh, the underlying issues or uh, uh, this multifactorial approach that I talked about in terms of prevention, we don't have the same evidence that it reduces mortality, reduces uh, uh, hospital stay, uh, uh, allows people to go home. So um, it, it's, it says a lot about uh, the prevention aspect to it. Uh, and doing that well in the first place. And that doesn't mean that, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's no hope for someone who has delirium. There definitely is, and they need attention and treatment, but uh, we need to think more uh, about uh, measures that we do to prevent it in the first place. Uh, so the treatment, uh, you'll hear, how do you treat delirium? Well, you treat the underlying cause. Uh, but I think a better way to approach it is to say, well, you treat the underlying causes uh, because often it's, it may be one predominant thing, like they came in with an infection, but you also have to think of all those other 
things that can contribute. And maybe, you know, that's why we don't have as great evidence about uh, the benefits of treating delirium when it sets in, because we need more of that uh, multi-dimensional kind of approach to dealing with it. You know, it's not enough just to treat the urinary tract infection, you have to do more. So what are the most common singular causes of delirium? Um, maybe we'll go back to the audience and make sure you're all still awake. Uh, what, do you, what do you think? Uh, what have you noticed in terms of uh, patients coming into the emergency room uh, caused their delirium? I would say infection, sepsis is probably the most common. Infections and substances, you said? I was going to say sepsis, infection, sepsis. Is oh, sepsis. Yeah. Okay, good. In the chat window, we have somebody saying polypharmacy, someone else saying UTI. Oh, there's a chat window. Yeah. Oh, sorry, guys. I, I didn't see Okay, it. if something comes up, I'll let you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, need that volunteer program. Okay, great. Polypharmacy, UTI. Good. So infections, especially UTI. Okay, good. Uh, stroke and TBI. Okay, good. Anyone else? Okay. So the most common cause is multifactorial. That's what I said uh, before. Uh, oh, no. Oh, why does, why does delirium affect the critically ill and the elderly? the most, so the elderly are more likely to have uh, more things going wrong with them, and so more likely to have uh, a multifactorial type of presentation. Critically ill, the more severe your problem is, the more likely you are to get delirium. I think sepsis is a great example. Uh, if you don't have, uh, if you think of the underlying patho, uh, pathophysiology that we mentioned earlier, sepsis. There's not enough oxygen going to your tissues. There's not enough oxygen going to the brain. There's more cortisol around uh, in, in sepsis. Uh, and so all those things, uh, uh, you know, uh, with the severity of the issue. So uh, it's the severity of the problem, but it's also the brain being fragile or maybe coming into it with more issues. So it's the person in there, not only with dementia, but they're someone who comes in, they already have polypharmacy, maybe they already have COPD and they don't have a lot of oxygen flowing to their brain to begin with. And then you add in addition another problem, that problem doesn't have to be as big in order to trigger uh, the delirium. So probably the number one cause of delirium is uh, polypharmacy, medications, drugs. Uh, so it's not only the number of drugs you're on, but it's also the type of drugs that you're on. So. Uh, what are the ones that uh, seem to be uh, the, uh, the biggest culprits? Any kind of sedative or hypnotic drugs, benzodiazepines, uh, benzodiazepine receptor agonists, uh, other things that can be sedative like uh, carbamazepine, uh, um, uh, uh, anti-epileptic drugs, uh, uh, gabapentin, Lyrica, uh, uh, narcotic medications, opioids uh, are a big class, anticholinergic drugs. Uh, so anticholinergic drugs is almost like a talk in and of itself. Uh, these are drugs that block off acetylcholine in the brain. Some drugs are implicitly anticholinergic, like atropine. We don't give a lot of people atropine, but for example, sometimes we give people atropine eye drops and those get absorbed systemically and those have been known to uh, cause uh, delirium. Sometimes we give people benztropine uh, for uh, tardive dyskinesia and that can be very delirogenic. Some medications are anticholinergic, but the anticholinergic effect is uh, much smaller. So uh, for example, uh, some things you might not have necessarily thought of like digoxin, uh, Lasix, uh, beta blockers, all have a small anticholinergic effect. If you build up enough of those, those can uh, give you enough of an anticholinergic problem to uh, develop delirium. And then some medications are kind of medium anticholinergic. That they have a, a significant anticholinergic effect, but that's not their primary uh, point. So uh, medications like antihistamines, uh, 
uh, or medications like anti-muscarinic uh, uh, bladder agents. Uh, so things like uh, um, uh, Detrol, uh, Vesicare, uh, medications like uh, uh, Benadryl, uh, Gravol, uh, uh, even uh, things uh, like uh, ranitidine uh, can have uh, uh, anticholinergic effect uh, uh, that goes along with the antihistamine or the anti-muscarinic effects of the medication. So we have strong, medium, and less strong, and it's not only about what you're on, but how many of them that you're on. The other thing I think that's important is uh, recognizing that uh, antipsychotics, although we use them to treat sometimes the symptoms of delirium, they can actually cause delirium in and of themselves as well. Uh, so uh, you can see uh, uh, the, the more psychoactive drugs you're on, uh, the more your risk of uh, delirium. Uh, and uh, if you're on a bunch of them, uh, you know, it's uh, really uh, quite high. So you'll see sometimes people come in just because of into emergency department with delirium just because of medications. Uh, the morphine was added on to uh, an already uh, significant uh, burden of medications and it caused, or the, the, they took more of their benzodiazepine or, you know, they're drinking alcohol and they took uh, a benzodiazepine, um, you know, that, that, that uh, uh, combination is definitely an issue. The other thing that's really important is uh, disturbances in fluids and electrolytes, dehydration. Uh, hypernatremia, hyponatremia, uh, even uh, uh, hypomagnesemia, uh, anything, uh, any kind of perturbation in the fluids and the rectus. So a part and part of uh, the workup, uh, just beside taking a good medication history, is uh, 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 also uh, looking at the electrolytes, looking at the creatinine, uh, doing extended electrolytes, uh, especially hypercalcemia. Uh, and, uh, and making sure that there's no, uh, no issue uh, there. Uh, and, then, uh, and then as everyone mentioned, infection. And uh, the, there's the important consideration of urinary tract infection. So you can overdo it uh, with uh, UTIs and you can underdo it with UTIs. The problem is there's a lot of people, and you've, you've probably heard this, a lot of elderly people who have bacteria in their urine, but they're asymptomatic from it. And it's not appropriate to treat people with bacteria in their urine who are elderly, who are asymptomatic. The problem is, you know, we think of urinary tract infection symptoms like dysuria, uh, urinary frequency, uh, uh, suprapubic pain uh, as, uh, as the classic symptoms, but delirium could be your symptom of a urinary tract infection as well. But also, I think it's important to not just think of, okay, somebody comes in delirious, you do a urine culture, it's positive, well, it has to be a urinary tract infection. I think you have to make sure that that's almost like your diagnosis of exclusion. And have you really made sure that there's nothing else uh, going on uh, that could be responsible for that delirium as well? But that being said, uh, we know that infection is one of the most common causes of delirium and one of the most common infections that causes delirium is urinary tract infection. So, you know, you're often caught between this, uh, you know, the one, the one dogma and the evidence of, okay, not treating asymptomatic bacteria, but at the same time realizing that, well, delirium could be your symptom and that uh, the infection and urinary tract infection is a common cause. So I think the important thing is to, in that is to keep an open mind, uh, make, make sure you're either de dealing with delirium or not, and make sure that you haven't just quickly jumped to the gun and said that this is a urinary tract infection without also considering uh, potentially other things that could be implicated. Um, Things are a bit more straightforward uh, with uh, uh, pneumonia or cellulitis or, uh, uh, or, or, or sepsis. You know, if you're growing uh, uh, E. coli in your blood, uh, it's, it's not supposed to be there. 
where maybe it is supposed to be in your bladder if you're older. Uh, so, uh, but even in things like, in cases like uh, pneumonia, it's important to recognize that sometimes older people are not going to have your classic presentation. They might not have fever. They're less likely to have fever. Uh, they're uh, less likely sometimes to have uh, obvious changes on chest x-ray uh, because of differences in the aging of uh, the immune system. And so you have to be prepared to know that sometimes uh, you're going to have atypical presentations of infection and that the person's predominant symptom uh, or their first presenting symptom might be delirium. I've had many cases of people get delirious first and then start coughing and have a fever two or three days later. And it was actually a pneumonia all along. Uh, so uh, we see that quite uh, commonly. And, you know, when I'm educating people who have had delirium, who are more likely to get delirium again, you know, that's what I tell people. I say, you know, this is, this is not normal uh, to have delirium. And if it happens, it's an important sign that you need to try to seek out uh, medical investigation sooner rather than later. If we can catch the problem earlier because the initial presentation was being delirious, uh, then, then you might actually even be able to prevent a, a hospital visit if you're able to get in and see your family doctor early enough. Um, so the other thing that I would uh, say is that there can be causes of delirium that, uh, and you can even argue, well, these aren't really delirium, uh, but we'll uh, you know, put them in here anyways, uh, that have stereotypical presentations. So this is where your history and physical exam is very important. So the cerebrovascular accident, the um, hemorrhage in the brain, the uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, you're going, to, you're going to find in your history, um, uh, hopefully, you know, that uh, there was uh, some kind of focality in terms of the presentation. They had aphasia, they have uh, one leg that's uh, suddenly uh, weak, uh, they have a, a new paresthesia uh, uh, on history or physical exam that points that to you. The, the actual yield of doing uh, a CT scan or an MRI scan of the brain of someone who doesn't have focal findings, who's just presenting with confusion, is really low, actually. Uh, it's something that is often done, that neuroimaging, but it might not be necessarily appropriate as maybe your first step. Uh, unless you're noticing something in terms of your history that points you to think that there might be a stroke. Does so that person have risk factors? Have they had stroke before? Uh, do they have anything in terms of their history or physical exam that's pointing you that way? Meningitis and encephalitis, you know, so uh, are they having fever? Are they having meningeal signs? Are they really uh, looking uh, unwell? Uh, that might point you uh, in terms of uh, uh, looking into that. Uh, and then uh, the other thing that's important uh, to think about is, uh, yes, uh, imaging uh, in the context of uh, uh, no focal findings as indicated when there's a fall or, or trauma. Uh, if, you've, uh, if you've hit your head um, and, uh, and then subsequently uh, develop a confusion, it's a sign of a a significant traumatic brain injury, and it would be important to do uh, neuroimaging. And just the fact that you don't have a subdural or a subarachnoid hemorrhage on your, uh, in your brain doesn't mean that you don't have a traumatic brain injury, and it doesn't mean that you're not going to have uh, cognitive sequelae of that traumatic brain injury as well. I think that's, that's this is often um, something that uh, we put too much emphasis on uh, a normal uh, neuroimaging. And it's for stroke as well. If your patient comes in, they have clear focal neural findings and that initial CT scan is normal and it's you know just two or three hours after presentation, that's actually the most common presentation of a cerebrovascular accident is a, is a normal uh, scan. It doesn't exclude uh, uh, 
uh, a new cerebrovascular accident. So, you know, you really want to rely on your uh, clinical assessment skills there. And, you know, traumatic brain injury too. Uh, there's a lot of brain injury that happens uh, that you can't see on uh, neuroimaging. Um, Yep, five minutes to finish up. We're actually almost done. Uh, so encephalopathy, uh, you know, the important thing to look for there is uh, asterixis, but pretty much a standard part of the workup for somebody with delirium should include uh, some uh, liver investigations and, uh, and, and checking the creatinine and, uh, and a blood gas. Uh, and then Wernicke Korsakoff, you're looking for ataxia and nystagmus. Uh, and an alcohol history. Other things that can cause uh, delirium to think about, uh, uh, hypoxia, hypercapnia, constipation, pain, uh, and also pain management, uh, sleep deprivation, uh, shock, of course, uh, malnutrition, uh, catheters, but also urinary retention, um, uh, restraints and immobility, and then withdrawal too. If you stop the opioids, if you stop the benzos, um, uh, that can cause delirium just as much as uh, the medications cause them in the first place. So the right answer if someone comes in and they're taking four milligrams of Ativan a day and they're confused as, and they've been doing that for a while, the answer is not to stop the Ativan cold turkey because that will actually just as likely cause delirium. It's very tricky. Uh, management of delirium. Uh, I guess I did have some important things that I saved till the end. Again, multifactorial, but everyone asks about medications. Benzodiazepines are not the right thing to give. There's no evidence that uh, managing either behavior from delirium or dementia uh, is effective with uh, benzodiazepines despite fairly robust uh, evidence. There's very robust evidence that suggests that uh, they're not useful and actually uh, potentially make things worse. Uh, that being said, you know, I'm not saying there's no role for benzos at all. If you have somebody who's uh, acutely a danger to themselves and other people in your emergency department, you need something to sedate them fast. Your antipsychotic's not going to work for half an hour, and sometimes you do have to give them something to sedate them quickly. But if you can buy time, do not use a benzodiazepine. The evidence exists for uh, antipsychotics, uh, both for behavioral issues with dementia and delirium, which you will both have to deal with in emergency room, especially atypical antipsychotics, and in particular, mostly Zyprexa and Risperidone. But we often use Seroquel, even though there's not as much evidence for it, because it has less chance of giving extra pyramidal symptoms. And sometimes you don't know if somebody has Parkinson's disease or Lewy body dementia. Um, there's some evidence for Haldol too, uh, but uh, generally atypicals are preferred, and, uh, but uh, they are a bit uh, problematic uh, at our institutions uh, to give if, uh, if we don't have a parental option. So if the person's refusing to take things PO and you have to give something uh, sub-Q, um, you know, we still have to resort to Haldol. But the general principle is starting low and going slowly. Uh, you can do a lot of harm if you uh, give too high a dose too quickly. So we're talking about half a milligram of Haldol, not five milligrams of Haldol. Risperidone, 0.125 milligrams, not, you know, one milligram. Uh, Zyprexa, two and a half milligrams, not 10 milligrams. Okay, and starting with that, and that's often enough. And if you give too much, uh, you can, uh, it can be very harmful uh, to the patient and actually make things worse. Uh, and cholinesterase inhibitors, like we use for dementia, uh, are not helpful for behavioral issues in uh, delirium. Uh, they're not going to help in delirium in any way or reduce uh, the chance uh, uh, of it uh, improving faster. Uh, and uh, they're also not particularly good for behavioral symptoms in dementia either. So uh, not something you're gonna, is gonna be in your toolbox in the emergency department. Melatonin actually has some evidence for the prevention but not the management of delirium. So it's something to, to consider, although it's based on very small studies. Melatonin over the counter uh, natural product.
so cholinesterase inhibitors, melatonin. Um, you know, here's the very small study, 145 people with melatonin, but uh, had a very significant benefit in terms of preventing. So key points, delirium uh, is common, goes undetected. Uh, it can be prevented. Uh, you can use the CAM tool to help identify it. Uh, programs like uh, HELP, unfortunately, uh, we don't have, but uh, would be useful, but uh, we can all do our own part. And uh, think about the underlying cause being multifactorial and not just uh, assuming it's one thing like a UTI and uh, the treatment, uh, uh, make sure you stick with uh, uh, these medications and use small doses. That's it. Sorry, uh, I didn't leave much time for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Duell. Um, if anybody has any questions, just um, put them in the chat box. I don't think we have.